Pesach is coming up. We want to get ready, prepare spiritually. And it's really deeply mystical, the, this holiday. You know, among the most significant, it's Jewish Independence Day. It's a new year, because we know it says in, in Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah that there's four new years. The Jewish New Year is really now. You know, the Rosh Chodesh Nisan is the Jewish New Year. Tishrei is the new year for the whole world, really. So it's actually the opposite of what people think. People think Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year. But actually, technically, the Jewish New Year is now. We start counting the months from now. From Nisan is the first month. Tishrei is the seventh month. It's Independence Day, because that's when we were taken out of Egypt. And in Egypt, we became a nation and were forged into one people. Right? So it's also our in, Independence Day. It's, uh, it's everything all in one. It's a pilgrimage festival. They used to go to Jerusalem. In ancient times, they used to go to the temple, and they would sacrifice the, uh, the Korban Pesach, which was the main thing. And it's important to remember that the, today, we just basically celebrate Chag Matzot. You know, if you read the Torah carefully, there's actually, it's almost like there's two distinct holidays. There's Chag Pesach, and there's Chag HaMatzot. Did you ever notice this before? So on the 14th of Nisan is Chag Pesach. That's when everybody would come and they would get into different groups and every group would have their lamb and they would do the sacrifice of the lamb. That was on the 14th. And then in the evening, once the 15th hits, that's already the Chag HaMatzot. That's when you would have your seder, you eat the, the sacrifice, the Korban Pesach, and as we know, you're supposed to eat it by midnight. And then you have seven days of Chag HaMatzot, starting on the 15th. So on the 14th of Nisan, you have the actual Chag HaPesach with the Korban. And then on the 15th, as we do now, you have your Seder and then seven days of Chag HaMatzot. So the 14th is not a Yom Tov. And then the 15th is a Yom Tov already, right? So that's how it used to be done back then. Now, since we don't have a temple, we don't do the Korban Pesach. So we, we don't have the 14th really as a holiday. It's more of like a preparation. Although we, we do various things. We do the biu chametz. You search for chametz. You destroy your chametz. There are still important mitzvahs and rituals to be done on the 14th. But then the holiday officially starts on the 15th. So it's important to remember that. And then so we, you, you have your special seder plate. And how do you set it up? What goes on the seder plate? Quick review. Top right is? What's in the top right? No, top. So on the very top, you have three matzot. Okay, so you have three matzot. And then on your plate, you have your, in the top right, you have the shank, the zra, right? The zra is the shank bone, which is for the korban, in memory of the korban. And then on the left, you have, across from the zra on the left, you have the beita. You have an egg. And then in the middle, the, no, the bone is in the top right. In the left, you have the top left is the egg. In the middle, you have the lettuce, the maror. And then the bottom right is the sweet stuff, the charoset. And then on the bottom left, you have karpas. And then at the bottom, some plates only have five spots. But then some have the sixth one, which is for either chazeret, which is the horseradish, or you can put salt water or vinegar or red wine vinegar, different customs. And then finally, you have, of course, your cup that you fill four times, you have the four cups of wine. If you counted up all those elements, how many things do you have total on the plate in front of you or on the table in front of you? So you have your three matzot, that's three, and then you have the six things on your plate and plus your cup. So you got 10, which is perfect because we know we like tens. There's patterns of 10 in creation and we know that all tens are somehow related. All tens correspond to each other, the 10 plagues the Ten Utterances of Creation, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Sfirot, and you'll, you might already notice how the Ten Things on the plate correspond to the Sfirot, because you have three Matzot at the top, which corresponds to the three upper Sfirot, the Mochin, right, the mental, the intellectual ones, and then you have the six things on the plate, which corresponds to the six Sfirot in the middle, which are considered the more masculine ones, right, Zeir and Pin, and then you have your cup, which is the the tenth sphere of Malchut, right, which is always described as a cup, as a vessel. The cup of wine is the tenth, is Malchut. So you can already see how it, they correspond to the tenth sphere. Of, and they correspond to the ten plagues, they correspond to the ten utterances. So we want to look at that. You know, there's this idea, I'm sure you've heard this before, that the ten plagues 
correspond to the 10 utterances of creation. You've heard of this? Why 10 plagues and why those particular plagues? So there's a few different reasons for it. One is because God wanted to show that, of course, there is only one God and God is in control of all nature, of all forces. And to destroy this notion of polytheism, idolatry, this pagan idea like the Egyptians had and like most other cultures had, that there are different gods and different idols. And there's a god of fire and a god of water and a god of this and a god of that and a god of fertility and a god of farming and you know, all those polytheistic things. So God wanted to show that he is in control. There's only one God who is in charge of all these things. So you'll notice how all of the plagues are an attack on a different Egyptian deity. So we will see that as, as we go along. So there's that. Why those particular ten? But then also they correspond to the ten utterances of creation. We know the Mishnah says, Ba'asara ma'amarot nivra ha'olam. That the God created the cosmos with ten utterances. God spoke the world into existence, right? It says ten times in, in chapter one of Bereshit, in Genesis chapter one, it says ten times, Vayomer Elohim. God spoke ten times. Now, we actually combine the last two times into one because it's like God made man and, and God ble- when God blessed man, the ninth utterance is God made man and the tenth is that God blessed man. And in the blessing, there's two Vayomers, so we combine that into one. Typically, and we say that the first utterance was actually Bereshit itself. The first verse of the Torah, that is the first utterance. Bereshit itself, even though it doesn't say God spoke, we, we assume that he did. So <laughs> Bereshit itself is the first utterance. And then the second one is God said, let there be light and so on. And then God said, let there be a firmament to divide the waters. And then all the way through, the ninth one was God said, let there, let's make man in our image. And then the tenth one is the blessing that God gave to mankind. So God spoke 10 times over the course of creation. It says 10 times God spoke in the first chapter. Those are the 10 utterances of creation. So they parallel the 10 plagues. And the 10 plagues parallel them in reverse order. So the idea is that just as God made the whole cosmos sequentially with these 10 utterances from 1 to 10, and the Egyptians, through their impure ways and their idolatries and their sins profaned the order of the cosmos. And so God punished them. God did these acts measure for measure to reverse the damage that they had done to the cosmos. And so the steps are in reverse. So the first plague corresponds to the final utterance. The first uh, utterance corresponds to the final plague. So it's backwards. So the first plague, last utterance, first utterance, last plague. That's how it goes. And you can see that. So if you look at, we can go through this really quickly. If you look at the 10 utterances, how they correspond to the 10 plagues in reverse. So the first utterance was Bereshit, which is all about, literally means beginnings. It's all about first, things that are first, the beginning of time, the beginning of space. It's all about firstness. And the final 10th plague was the Makat Bechorot, right? The plague of the firstborn. So again, an attack on all things first, the first in each generation. Then the second utterance was Vayehi O, right? God said, let there be light. So corresponding to that, what was the ninth plague? You have darkness, right? So God brings darkness corresponding to the light that he had brought into the world originally. And then the third plague or the third utterance, well, we're doing it in the reverse order. So the third utterance was, what did God make third? The third thing it says, Yehi Rakia, right? Betochamayim. God said, let there be a firmament to separate from the upper waters and the lower waters. The waters on earth and in the physical dimensions and the waters above, which really is referring to the heavens. You know, heaven is called Shamayim, which literally means Shamayim, that there's water there. And that there's also water in the heavens. A mekareb maim aliyotav. God built the upper worlds in water too. So we had a whole class about that, for those who remember, about the four the four rabbis who went to heaven, and Rabbi Akiva, one of these four rabbis that went to heaven, before they went there, he said, Al tomru maim maim. 
You don't say water, water. So we talked about that. Why did he say that? When you go up to the heavens, you will see water. What does that mean? So we talked about that before. You can see the recording if you missed it about the upper waters, how there's also water in the heavens. There's something very special and spiritual about waters. And remember, on the second day, not only were the heavens created, but also Gehenom. Our sages say that hell was also created on the second day. God separated the upper worlds from the lower worlds. And that's why the second day is the only day where God didn't say it was good. On every other day, God saw that it was good. But on the second day, it wasn't good. Why wasn't it good on the second day? Because God had made Gehenom, God brought into the world also evil and darkness. The whole Sitra Achra, the whole realm of evil, was brought into the world on the second day. So the second day is the division of the upper waters and the lower waters and the creation of heaven and hell and the whole notion of the afterlife as well, of death and the afterlife. That all came about on the second day and that's why that day was not described as being good. So what does that correspond to on the plagues? Arbe, exactly, which is, what's Arbe? The locust, right? The locust swarms, the swarms of locust. Okay, so what's the connection between locust swarms and the separation of the waters or the creations of, hev- of the upper worlds and the lower worlds of heaven and hell? What's the connection? Might not seem so obvious, but again, you also have to look at Egyptian mythology and what did it mean to the Egyptians? So the locust swarms, these things go dormant for many years. You don't see them. And then usually once in like 17 years or so, they quite literally come out of the ground in mass amounts. So you can just picture this, that in the wilderness, there's nothing for years. And then suddenly, you know, once in 17 years or so, they all start emerging out of the ground. If you've ever seen it, you can like watch a BBC documentary about it or David Attenborough will tell you how, show you how, uh, how this happens. It's really an amazing site where they all pop out of the ground. You know, you can imagine millions and millions of them start popping out of the ground. And it's like a scene from a zombie movie. It looks like very much like a zombie apocalypse. That It's like a resurrection of these, of these locusts that have been, you know, dormant for many years. And suddenly they're like popping out of the ground, out of the dust and flying up into the air and consuming everything in their path. So there's this symbolism, a mythological symbolism of this locust also as representing the underworld, as coming from the worlds beneath and consuming everything in their wake. So there's that connection to Gehenom and to resurrection and coming back from the dead, these cicadas that have been almost dead for many years, and they're coming back from the dead and consuming everything in their path. The fourth utterance was Yikavu Amayim, right? God gathered the lower waters and the earth appeared. So there's the gathering of the lower waters and the appearance of the earth. And what does that correspond to? What was the seventh plague? Is hail, barad. Barad is literally water in its most destructive form coming from the sky. Not like soft snow, not like uh, blessed rain, but hail. If you read what it says, the barad specifically attacked the land. It says, So the, the hail will come upon the entire land of Egypt. And not just striking the people and the animals. That it specifically attacked the earth itself. Right? So you have water congealed in a very hard form that's destroying the land. So you can see the connection to the fourth, to the fourth utterance which is bringing together the lower waters and forming the earth. The earth is a planet all full of water, right? Where 70% of our surface is covered in water. There's water in in the clouds, in the atmosphere. It's all, there's water everywhere. So using those lower waters to make hail and to destroy the very earth that God formed through the fourth utterance. So you can see the connection. So it emphasizes as well that the barad, the hail, specifically destroyed the fields and the land. And the tree too. But kol And it broke also the trees. So that's the barad and the fourth utterance. The fifth utterance after the earth was tad Let the earth bring forth vegetation, plant life. Right? That was the fifth utterance. And what was the sixth plague corresponding to that? The sixth plague was and what's the connection to the flowers and the plants 
and the vegetation of the, of the fifth utterance. So if you look at the language again, the language makes it very clear on each of these. Because how is the sixth plague described, if you remember the wording, Vayomer Hashem el Moshe, ve'el Aaron, k'hu lachem maloch ofnechem piach kifshan. First they were supposed to take some of the dirt in the ovens, and Moses threw it up into the air, le'enei faro, before Pharaoh, ve'aya le'avak al kol eretz Mitzrayim, and it turned into a dust that spread over the whole land. And then, that it was like a flower, it blossomed. The boils blossomed on the, the language that, that's used is poreach, that they blossomed on their bodies, the shechin, the boils. They were abba abuot, they were like blossoming bubbles on their skin. So the connection to the blossoming of the fifth utterance that God made the earth bloom with flowers and vegetation and plants and things like that. And then the f- next utterance, the sixth utterance, was God made me'orot, the luminaries in the sky, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all these other things, set them in their orbits. And that corresponds to Dever, the plague. And what's the connection there? So again, if you look at the language, it's absolutely perfectly precise. Each one of these, in the language of the plague, alludes to creation just like we saw previously with Poreach, you see the same thing here. Because if you remember in Genesis, the way that the luminaries were created, it says, Vayomer Elohim yi meorot birki ha-shamayim, let there be luminaries in the sky, leavdil bein hayom uvein halayla, to separate between day and night, vehayu leotot u lemoadim, and they will be for signs and for moadim, for holidays, for set times, to be able to track time. And look at this, really amazing. The parallel verse in the plagues. Listen to this verse. It's the only place where this word appears in the plagues. Vaisem Hashem Moed. God made us a, a time. He God set a time. Moed leemor. Machar yase Hashem hadavar aze ba'aretz. Vayas Hashem et hadavar aze mimachorat. Vayamot kol mikne mitzrayim. And the devil came. But again, look at the language. It's the only one that has this word. That God set a moed. So in the same thing, in the same way that in Genesis, God says, I made the luminaries le moadim. And here, same. God says, I made a moed to bring about the plague. So it was connected again to the astronomical cycles and signs that God set a particular moed. So it's the, the exact same terminology used between those two things, connecting the plague to the utterance. And there's many other ways you can meditate upon this. What is the connection between the stars and the plague, the pestilence, which was specifically killing the mikne, killing the Egyptian animals. If you think about the connection for the Egyptians, the stars, which they worshipped, right? They worshipped the sun, they worshipped the moon, they worshipped all the different things and stars and constellations. And all of their gods were also had animal forms. So there's a very clear connection between the animals and the stars, because they all have their symbols. You know, there's the falcon-headed god and the jackal-headed god and the crocodile-headed god. All their gods have all kinds of different animal heads and body parts. So there's a clear association between the stars, the luminaries, which they worshipped also as gods, and as animals, which symbolize the gods. And this plague was specifically to destroy those same animals that the Egyptians worshipped as or saw as symbols of their deities. So there's that connection too. And then the next utterance, so after the luminaries on the fifth day, what did God make? Day five? So the utterance. The utterance was God made, the let the waters team forth with life, the ofi alfef, and there will be birds in the sky. So the next utterance is the creation of fish and birds. Okay, and then that, and then also taninim gdolim, we talked about that. Last time, God made the giant reptiles and things and serpents. So there's serpents, reptiles, sea monsters, fish and birds. And then that corresponds to the plague of Arov, which means what? Arov has actually many, it's maybe the most mysterious one. It's the one that has a lot of different opinions. What was the Arov? What was that plague? So it's some kind of swarm or something. The word itself if we were to take the simplest understanding just on, based on the scriptural wording, like that root, Arov, what's an Orev? An Orev is a raven, 
that word is used in Genesis to refer to a raven, like with Noah and, and uh, elsewhere. So it's according to that, there's one opinion that it's talking to a flock of, of vicious birds, like ravens and things, which again corresponds nicely to the utterance where God created birds. And for the Egyptians as well, the birds were very symbolic because their main gods were represented by birds, Horus, Isis, Nephthys, they all had bird image, bird symbols. So it's like God is using those same birds to attack the Egyptians and to harm them. So according to the simplest understanding, it's a swarm of, of vicious birds. Uh, but there are other interpretations. Rashi says, Et ha'orev kol chayot ra'ot, all kinds of dangerous animals, nechashim v'akravim. And specifically, he mentions snakes and scorpions. So that also connects because God also made, remember the serpents, taninim agdolim. God made this, the various serpents and reptiles on the fifth day in that utterance. So that connects to this as well, to send nechashim. The Ibn Ezra says, Chayot ra'ot me'urbot kmo arayot ze'evim ve'dubim ve'namerim. So that's maybe the one that we see more in the movies and books. The Ibn Ezra says that they were lions and wolves and bears and, all kind, and leopards and all kinds of animals like that. And the Shadal says, which is also really interesting, Shmuel David Lutzato's, the Targumim translated it, the old Aramaic uh, translations said that it's kol minei zvuvim that these are flies, that it's a swarm of flies. And why does this make sense? He says, Adat azot krova It makes the most sense to me. Why does it make the most sense? Ki lo yuvan ech tavona chayot bebatim. So the Torah says that the Arov came into people's homes. So he's saying, well, how can animals come into people's homes? Like they could have just like shuttered their doors and like boarded up their houses. So how could these big animals break through into their houses? I mean, I guess they could have. Maybe God gave them extra power. But he's saying that according to the natural ways, the only way that to fit the Torah's description that the Arov went into their houses and filled their houses is it would make sense if it was flies, if it was a swarm of flies that was able to go in even through little holes. So that also connects Ophia Ofef there's a question if flying insects, were they created on the fifth day or on the sixth day? When God said he's making all the flying things, did that, was that just birds or does that include all flying things? Did that include bats? Did that include flying insects? What is exactly the definition of of? So uh, they can fit either way. In any way you interpret it, it could be the reptiles, it could be the serpents, it could be the insects, it could be the ravens and the vicious birds, but they all really tie into what God created on the fifth day. And, and yet it does fit into the sheretz also. Because it says yishretzu, sheretz also implies bugs and insects. So since the language there was God said, let's make bugs, bugs seems to have also been created on the fifth day in this utterance. And that would correspond to these insect bugs, uh, the flies. Next, God created on the sixth day animals. The next utterance was the creation of all the land animals, the major, the mammals and land beasts and all of that. And the next plague is going in reverse again. The third plague is kinim, which is lice, right? And that's also uh, fits really nicely because lice are really among the smallest animals. A louse is an animal too. It's part of the animal kingdom. And lice are the tiniest little animals. So God is showing his fine control over all of nature, including the tiniest little animals that he created. And we know that this is the very plague where the Egyptian magicians gave up. Exactly. The Egyptian magician said, right? This is the finger of God. They could not mimic this one. The other plagues, they could also make blood and they could also bring out some frogs. But once it got to lice, they couldn't do it. And our sages say, because that requires such fine skill that something so small, you can't make an illusion out of it, right? Illusions have to be bigger than this, that the magic, black magic doesn't go this far, that it's unable to control such small, tiny things. So God is showing his ability to control even the tiniest of creatures that he created. And the la- la- laos is an animal as well. So the sixth, the sixth day, that utterance was the creation of all 
of all the other animals. And the lice also affected, again, not just the people, but also the animals were affected by the lice. And then finally, just to conclude the list, God made, the ninth utterance was God made humans. And of course, God gave humans a special divine knowledge. And he told them to be fruitful. God commanded, the first command that he gave was, be fruitful and multiply. That was the command to the humans. And that corresponds neatly to the second plague, which is frogs. The frog in Egypt was uh, the god of fertility called uh, Heket. Heket was the frog-headed god of fertility. So frogs reproduce really quickly, right? And so frogs are a symbol of fertility. And so it's very ironic, again, that God used the Egyptian symbol for fertility to punish them with super fertility. There were frogs everywhere. They were reproducing so quickly. In fact, hmm? yeah, they went everywhere. They jumped into their beds, right? They jumped into their ovens. And according to one tradition, it was one frog that emerged and then it just kept splitting. And every time they tried to whack it, it would split again and it would split again. But the idea of, repro- of like super reproduction, the Egyptians worshipped the frog as a god of fertility. And so they were specifically punished with super fertility. And that corresponds again to Adam being commanded to be fruitful and to multiply. So that same energy of fertility taking place with the frog. And it's interesting also the Arizal has a lot to say about the word tzfardea because it has dea in it. It has the root of da'at in it. So God gave man this special divine wisdom, knowledge, da'at. And the frog also has, the Arizal splits the word tzfardea into the letters tzadi pei reish and dalid ayin. That's a little more complicated to meditate on. If you have time, you can look up what the Arizal says about that. But the frog as a symbol of da'at, of this special wisdom that God gave man. So there's that connection as well. And finally, the tenth utterance of creation was that God blessed mankind to be the dominant species on the planet and all of that. And that corresponds to blood, the, the Nile turning to blood. Remember, the Nile River was the lifeline of all of Egypt. That was their source of blessing. They worshipped the Nile as a god. And so what they believed was the source of their blessing. And the Egyptians saw the Nile as the source of their blessing. And that corresponds to the 10th utterance, which is God's first blessing to mankind. So to remind the Egyptians of where blessings really come from. It doesn't come from the Nile. God killed the Nile, right? Literally made the Nile bleed, like as if bleeding to death. Right, so it was an attack on the Egyptian Nile god, essentially. So that's how a brief overview. There's a lot more you can meditate on each of these connections, but you can think about that, that the, the 10 utterances of creation, God made 10 plagues specifically to reverse. Each one was symbolic of one of the utterances of creation. So we can also see, we saw how they parallel to the 10 spherot, 10 elements on your table, on your Pesach table, on your Sedel plate. And you have the same 10 corresponding to the 10 utterances corresponding to the 10 plagues. So the zroa is in the top right. You have your three matzot on top. That's the intellectual ones, the chokhmah binadat. Then you have your zroa in the top right. That's in the position of, in the sfirot, in the position of chesed. Right? Chesed is in the top right. What's the connection between zroa and chesed? What does the zroa represent, the shank? God's outstretched arm, right? So it's actually a sign of God's chesed, that God took us out of slavery, saved us out of Egypt. And that's an act, the ultimate act of chesed. So the beitza, you have the zroa on the right, which is the chesed. You have the beitza on the left, which is opposite chesed is gvura. And what is the beitza supposed to represent? The hard-boiled egg. So yeah, the classic explanation is that the hard-boiled egg Really, the simplest answer is that it represents the korban, the extra sacrifice that they used to bring in the temple, the korban chagiga. So there was the korban Pesach, which was the Paschal lamb. But then on the holidays, you also had to bring the korban chagiga, right? The extra holiday sacrifice that they brought on all the holidays, on all the pilgrimage festivals. So that rep- the egg represents the korban chagiga, but also why an egg specifically? Because it's supposed to represent God's judgment, God's precise judgment. And that God also judges us and sends us retribution when we need it. But he does it in such a way that we come out of it stronger than before. 
Just like an egg, the more you cook it, the harder it becomes. So that's supposed to be like a metaphor, a symbol for the Jewish people, that although we've gone through so much in history, we only get stronger. We come out of each thing better than before, stronger than before. And that's symbolized by the egg, which gets stronger the longer that you cook it. And that corresponds to God's judgment, the din, the gvura part. It's also a symbol of mourning. Like a whole egg can also be a symbolic of mourning, which again represents the left side, the side of, of death and the side of suffering and the side of punishment and retribution. Okay, then we have in the middle, maror, which is the lettuce, which is, corresponds to the big middle sphere of, of tiferet. And that's something that we need to come back to because it's the most mysterious of everything in the whole Pesach Seder, the maror is the one that is the least understood. Why do we have this herb? What is the point of this herb? Why is it such a big deal? It's an actual Torah mitzvah to eat it. Why? And amazingly enough, uh, the Midrash says that even King Solomon didn't know why. The wisest man in the world didn't know the meaning of maror. Okay, the Midrash says in Vayikar Ulkachtem lachem bayom harishon, so it's talking about Sukkot, that you're supposed to take for yourself the four species, the Lulav and the Etrog and all that, even though it says that King Solomon received all the Achuchmah ve'amadan atunlach, that God gave King Solomon all the wisdom, nonetheless, what does it say? And it says also that Shlomo ve'yachkem mikol adam, that Shlomo was wiser than all human beings. So if anybody knew what these things mean, it should be him. But, yashavlo tamea al arba'a minin halalu, that King Solomon did not know what is the secret of the four species, the arba'a minim of Sukkot. He didn't understand that. Shane'emar, because how do we know? It says in Mishlei, in King Solomon's Proverbs, there's a verse that says, shlosha hema niflau mimeni. There's three things that I don't understand, ve'arba'a lo yedatim, and four things that I don't know. So King Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, the one who had all the wisdom, God gave him all the wisdom. He says in Proverbs, there's three things that I couldn't figure out and there's four things I don't know. What are those things? So Shlosha, Hema, what are those three things? Pesach, Matzah, Maro. He didn't know the mystery of what we say in the Seder. We say Pesach, Matzah, Maro, right? Those three things that we point to, the Pesach sacrifice, the Matzahs and the Maro. King Solomon says, I don't know the secret of this. Like, there's something more here that I don't understand. And the other things, the arba'a, lo yedatim, and the four things that I don't know, elu arba'a minim she'balulav. So these are the fourth species of the lulav. Okay, so even King Solomon didn't know Maro. So we'll come back to that at the end. Okay, charoset is the only sweet thing over there on the plate. And charoset is on the bottom right, which is the place of netzach. Netzach means literally victory. Netzach is a very positive quality. It's, a, it's victory, it's persistence, it's perseverance, it's eternity. And charoset is the sweet thing. And that represents sweet victory as well. On the one hand, we say it's like the mortar that the, that the Israelites used, but also it represents the sweetness of victory, of netzach. Right? That's a good thing. And we temper the bitter herb with the sweet charoset. That ultimately that there's the goodness, there's the sweetness, there's the victory. That's haroset. On the other side is karpas, which is also deeply mystical, corresponds to hod, and we'll come back to that as well. We'll leave karpas and maror to the very end. Those are the two vegetables. The two vegetables are puzzling because nobody wants to eat vegetables, right? The, the vegan stuff we'll leave to the end. So karpas and maror we'll come back to. Lastly, corresponding to yisod is the uh, salt water, vinegar, horseradish, whatever you want to put over there. And then you have the cup, which is malchut, which is the feminine, which is always described as a receptacle, the nukva, the final sfirah, that's like a cup. If you look on the tree of life, the, the etzachayim or ilan kadosh of the sfirot, the malchut's always at the very bottom, and it's like a, a cup that receives, it's always described as being empty of its own. It doesn't have its own energy, it's just receiving divine energy, you know, from above. It's a receptacle, it's like the cup, it's like a cup of blessing. So that's how they correspond to each other. So now you have, hopefully you can hold that all in your head. You have the 10 uh, utterances, the 10 plagues, the 10 sfirot, and the 10 things on your Seder play that all go together. And they also correspond to the 10 commandments. So for fun, what you can do is, and I did this, you can make a chart and make five columns and then write them all out and then connect them all 
and then meditate on each row and see how they all fit together. And it's fun. And you can do that and you can spend a few so hours meditating on it. Which way does it, correspond? it goes straight because the Ten Commandments correspond to the Ten Utterances. Uh, oh, one one. Yeah, one to, corresponding to the Ten Utterances in order. Okay, now, the actual seder itself. This is the main part that I wanted to get into. That was the introduction. That was a good 40-minute introduction. Okay, so <laughs> I thought that was review. I thought that would go faster. Okay, then you have uh, the, the steps of the seder. How many steps are there in the seder? Who remembers the rhyme that the kids learn at school? Kadesh, Uchatz, and then? Karpas, Yachatz. Magid, Rochza, Motzi, Matza, Maror, Korech, Shulchan, Orech, Tzafun, Barech, Halel, Nirza, right? So if you count how many steps there are, some people will say 15 because there's 15, like I guess, well, there's 16 words, but some people count it as 15, but it's really 14 because Motzi, Matza, they, some people say that's two separate steps, but it's really one step. It's you're eating the Matza, right? You're just, you're making two brachas, but you're eating, it's one action of eating the matzah. So it's 14 steps. And I think that the 14 is not a coincidence. Why did Chazal specifically want to immortalize the seder in 14 steps? What is the significance of the number 14? Because you find 14 everywhere in the Pesach story. There's 14 all over the place. Where do we see 14? Yad. Yad. Where else? That's the last one I'm going to come back to. <laughs> so yeah, first of all, we said Korban Pesach is on the 14th of Nisan. So the holiday really begins on the 14th of Nisan. So we start the Seder on the 15th, but there's the, the Korban Pesach, like we said earlier, begins on the 14th. So the holiday starts on the 14th of Nisan. Masachet Pesachim, which is the Talmud and the Mishnah that's all about Pesach, actually begins by saying Or Asar, that the, at the beginning of the, of the 14th day, or what does that mean, Or Asar, right? What does that mean, the 14th, at the light of the 14th? So the Gemara itself and the Mishnah itself starts with the 14th. The holiday begins really on the 14th. Where else do you see 14 with, with Pesach? If you look at Yad, the God t- says that he took us out of Egypt with a strong hand, beyad chazaka natuya, and with an outstretched arm. And the, the term Yad Hashem, or Yad Gdola, or whatever Yad Chazaka, is used throughout the whole Exodus narrative. And if you count how many times it says Yad, at least how many I counted, maybe I miscounted, but I counted 14 times that the word Yad is used. And the word Yad itself is 14, right? Yud Dalid is 14. So, and then you have the word used 14 times, and it's 14, and the holiday begins on the 14th, and there's all these, this pattern of 14. So, why the 14 steps? What is the connection here? What, why 14? Aside from the fact that it's God's strong hand that took us out of Egypt, and ha- hand is 14, I think there's a lot more here to the number 14 and to Pesach. So, going back to creation, you'll notice something really amazing. Uh, first of all, we, there's a very deep connection between Pesach and creation and Shabbat. Pesach and Shabbat are deeply linked. In fact, we call Pesach Shabbat. Right? We refer to Pesach as a Shabbat. And this was actually a major debate between the three groups of Jews 2,000 years ago. Right? We talked about this before, that at the end of the Second Temple, there were three types of Jews three Jewish divisions in, in Israel, in Judea. There was the Prushim, the Tzdukim, and the Isiim. And they actually all had a different approach to how you calculate the Sfirat HaOmer period between Pesach and Shavuot. Because God commands that from Pesach to Shavuot, you're supposed to count 50 days. Right? And it says, you have to count it Shabbat, from the day after Shabbat. So what does that mean the day after Shabbat? We start counting, like the Purushim did, we start counting from the day after the first day of Pesach, like from the second day of Pesach, because we consider the Pesach Yom Tov Shabbat. We say that this is Shabbat, the Pesach is also Shabbat. So we start counting from the very next day, from the second day of Pesach, we count 49 days, and the 50th day is Shavuot. But the Tzedukim and the Isim didn't count that way because they didn't consider Pesach a Shabbat. They said, no, Pesach is Pesach. That's a Yom Tov. Shabbat is Shabbat. So they said, Mimacharat Shabbat means you count from 
the first Shabbat. Now, that was the distinction between the Tzedukim and the Isim. They also didn't do it the same way. The Tzedukim said, you count from the first Shabbat of Pesach. The, the Isim said, no, Pesach has to be over. And then once Pesach ends, Mimacharat Shabbat means that the, the first Shabbat after the holiday. So practically what ended up happening is, in the end of the Second Temple period, is Shavuot was celebrated on three different days. Okay, the Purushim celebrated Shavuot 49 days from the second day of Pesach. The Tzedukim celebrated Shavuot 49 days from the first Shabbat in Pesach. And the Isim celebrated Shavuot always on the 15th of Nisan, a whole week after us, on the 15th of Nisan from the first, from the first Sunday after Pesach. Now the Tzedukim and Purushim, because Pesach could fall on Shabbat, sometimes the Purushim and Tzedukim the Sadducees and Pharisees celebrated Shavuot on the same day. Because if it was a year where, Shabbat, where Pesach fell on Shabbat, then they agree. It's Yom Tov and Shabbat. So every so often, actually, relatively frequently, they could, the Tzedukim and Prushim could actually have Shavuot on the same day. But the Isim always did it on the 15th of Sivan. It was always later, by at least a week. And our tradition is, no, we always insisted that Pesach is a Shabbat, Mimacharat Shabbat means from Pesach. That was the idea. So we talked about this before. We talked about Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, very fascinating uh, part of our history. But why did our sages say that? Why did they insist that Pesach is a Shabbat? Doesn't it make, it's the Torah says Mimacharat Shabbat. So it almost seems like this, the Sadducees makes more sense on a very pshat, practical level. It says Shabbat. Oh, Shabbat you can okay. Why is it Good, exactly, sense? exactly. So look at what it says in, in the Zohar. Our sages are saying Pesach is Shabbat. It's the same thing, it's together. The Zohar says like this, mm-hmm. We know that there were 10 utterances in creation, and there were 10 utterances, 10 commandments at Mount Sinai. 10 utterances in creation, and 10 commandments. Okay, why? Begin the alma loid bare because God did not create the world ella begin oraita, except for the Torah, for His law. The only reason that God created the world to begin with is so that He could eventually give mankind His law, God's law. The chol zimna de Israel mitaske mitaske be oraita, and whenever the Jewish people are engaged in Torah, alma mitkayama, the world endures. Because were it not for the Torah, there would be no need for the world. God created the world with the intention to eventually reveal His, his Torah, His law. And if the Jewish people, Israel, didn't study in Torah, didn't engage in Torah, didn't fulfill Torah, what does it say? It's a verse that we all know from Yirmiyahu, from Jeremiah 33. We've heard it many times. God says, if it wasn't for my Torah, for my covenant day and night, if it wasn't for the fact that people were observing my covenant day and night, what did God say? I would never have bothered to create the heavens and the earth. Right? So Jeremiah the prophet quotes God as saying, were it not for my Torah law being observed and studied at all times day and night, I wouldn't bother making the world. So the whole world was created for the sake of God revealing his word ultimately. So we see that there's a very clear connection between the Exodus and the giving of the Torah and creation. You see a very clear link between Pesach and Shabbat. If it wasn't for Pesach, there would be no Shabbat. If it wasn't for the Exodus, there would be no creation. There would be no need for creation. If there was no Genesis, there's no Exodus. If there's no Exodus, there's no Genesis. They go together. And what's amazing is, if you look at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments are given twice. We read about the Ten Commandments in the Torah twice. Once in Exodus, in Shemot. Once in Dvarim. Once the way God decreed it. And once from the perspective of Moses. Moshe wrote Dvarim in his, from his point of view. And what's the difference between the two sets of Ten Commandments? They're not identical. There are slight differences between them. And the biggest difference between them is Shabbat. The way that Shabbat is described. So at first, in Exodus, 
in Shemot, this is what it says about Shabbat. So the fourth commandment is to keep Shabbat. Zachoret Yom HaShabbat Lekotsho. Okay, so commemorate the Sabbath. Sheshet Yamim Tavod Ve'asit HaKol Melachtecha. We know that. You work for six days. Ve'yom HaShvi Shabbat Le'ashem. And the seventh day is for God. You don't do any work. We know that. And then, why? So then we're given the reason why. In the text of the Ten Commandments, the first time, it says, why should you keep Shabbat? Because in six days God created the heavens and the earth, and the seas and everything within them. Because God created the world in six days. So here, the Ten Commandments, it's telling you keep Shabbat because God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. So you too should work for six days and rest on the seventh. So here, the reason that you're supposed to keep Shabbat is because God did so, because of creation, going back to creation. But then look at the second text of the Ten Commandments. Not the same. In Dvarim, the text of the Ten Commandments is different. What does it say? Shamor et Yom Shabbat. So first, instead of saying commemorate, it says safeguard, observe, keep. Keep the Sabbath protected, safeguarded. Shamor et Yom HaShabbat lekotsho. Kasher tziva Hashem Eloecha. Like God commanded you then, that first time. And then the similar language. Sheshet yamim tavod. You should work six days. Yom HaShri Shabbat Hashem. Don't do any work. That part's more or less the same. But then, what is the reason here? This is the different part. The reason given there was because of creation. But what's the reason here? Vezacharta ki eved ha'ita be'eretz Mitzrayim. Because you were a slave in Egypt, again the yad with a strong hand that was in the Ten Commandments. That's why God commanded you to keep Shabbat. Wait, what? The first time you said God commanded us to keep Shabbat because of creation. Here he's saying, no, no, no. God wants you to keep Shabbat because you were a slave. And you're not a slave anymore. So don't work seven days a week. Because only slaves work seven days a week. If you're working seven days a week, consider yourself a slave. A free man, a free woman, you can take a day off at least once a week. One day where nobody bothers you. Turn off your cell phone, turn off your emails, you're unavailable. Only a free man could do that. If you're always attached to whatever it is, your business, your employees, your boss, your company, you're not a free man, you're a slave. So here in Dvarim, it says you keep Shabbat because you're not a slave. So take a day off. But over there, it said, no, you keep Shabbat because of creation. So which is it? So it's both. So you see, again, the connection between Pesach, between coming out of slavery and creation. They go hand in hand. Without creation, there would be no Pesach. And without Pesach, there would be no creation. That's why Pesach really is a Shabbat. And that's why every Shabbat, what do we do when we say Kiddush? We say Zecher Liyatzeat Mitzrayim. On every Friday Kiddush, we bring in Shabbat and we also commemorate the Exodus. Why? It's like every Shabbat Kiddush, every Shabbat meal is a mini Pesach Seder that you're commemorating Pesach. And on Pesach, you're commemorating Shabbat. Because at the same time, we say Pesach is a Shabbat and Shabbat is a Pesach. So the two go hand in hand. And so now we can really understand why our sages insisted, and rightly so, that Pesach is a Shabbat. So when the Torah says to count me Macharat Shabbat, of course it means from Pesach. Because Pesach is Shabbat too. That's my theory, by the way. I wrote about this a couple of years ago. I have a hypothesis for the Shabbat Agadol thing. You know, we have Shabbat. The, the Shabbat before Pesach is called the Great Shabbat, Shabbat Agadol. Mm-hmm. It's the only holiday that has that. We don't call any other Shabbat before any other holiday Shabbat Agadol, the Great Shabbat. So there are so many different theories for why that Shabbat is called Shabbat Agadol. And I'm not going to list them all now. There's got to be, I don't know, at least 10 or more different hypotheses, theories, and it seems like nobody really knows why specifically it's called Shabbat Agadol. There are many explanations for it. A few years ago, I proposed my own. I don't know if anybody else said this before me. I've never seen it. Anybody. Maybe somebody did. But I had a thought that if, if you go back 2,000 years ago, the big debate at the time is, do you consider Pesach a Shabbat or not? Because the Tzedukim and the Isim said no. And we know that our sages instituted a number of things to reinforce that what we're doing is true contrary to the tzedukim, including eating chamin on Shabbat, right? You're supposed to eat slow-cooked food because the tzedukim wouldn't eat 
the slow cooked food on Shabbat. They only ate cold food pre prepared before. They did not allow leaving a crock pot on. All right? So, our sages instituted that and various other things, like making sure you have candles throughout the course of Shabbat because they were sitting in the dark and they didn't allow fire to be burnt. We allowed bur- lighting a fire and leaving it on for Shabbat. They didn't. They did not allow any fires burning on Shabbat. So, we know our sages instituted various things to show that the tzedukim were wrong. So, I think this is simply my hypothesis. I don't know if it's true, but I think the sages also called Pesach, uh, the Shabbat before Pesach Shabbat Agadol to distinguish between the fact that Pesach is also Shabbat. So it's like you have two Shabbats that week. You have Shabbat HaGadol, and then you have the, which is the actual Shabbat, and then you have Pesach, which is also a Shabbat. So to distinguish between the two Shabbats, it's the only time that you kind of have two Shabbats in one week. So to distinguish between the two Shabbats, uh, I believe maybe that's another reason for why you have Shabbat HaGadol on, on the actual Saturday is Shabbat HaGadol. And then Pesach is whenever... If, the next day, a few days later, is going to be is Pesach, which is also a Shabbat. Then this doesn't work. So. <laughs> but it still works because it's a week before. So the week before Pesach, so that you don't confuse your Shabbat, is Shabbat Gadol. Anyway, that was just my, my hypothesis. Interesting also, there's a whole story. I don't know if we have time for it. Maybe I'll skip it. But there's a whole story of how Hillel became the president of Israel. It's in Masachat Pesachim. It's how did Hillel, over 2,000 years ago, he came from Babel. Hillel was born in, in Babel, in Babylon, and then he immigrated to Israel, and he learned with Shmaya and Aftalion. And then this foreigner became the president of Israel, the president of Judea, of the Sanhedrin. How did he become the president? And it says, Tanu Rabbanan, alachazu nita'alma mibnei Batera. At that time, the president, the Sanhedrin, was controlled by a school of Batera, bnei Batera, before the school of Hillel. And they forgot that one year, the Pesach time, the 14th of Nisan, fell on Shabbat. That's tricky. What do you do? Does Pesach override Shabbat? Can you sacrifice the Paschal lamb on Shabbat? Because we're not allowed to cook on Shabbat. You're not allowed to slaughter animals on Shabbat. So, but now it's Pesach. On Shabbat, the 14th of Nisan fell on Shabbat. So what do you do? No, so, so there's a rule. But whenever it becomes more frequent, always takes precedence over what comes. So Shabbat's more frequent. So that would imply that you don't do the Korban Pesach on the 14th. But that's a whole problem. Then now what? What do you do? Do you then have to do the Korban, what, on the 15th, on the 13th? It, it, it creates... Right, right. So that was the question. Suddenly, this year, Shabbat's gonna be, Pesach is going to be on Shabbat. And it looks like suddenly, the Bnei Betera, they forgot their law. What do we do in this situation? It hadn't happened, I guess, for a number of years. And now they were stuck. Who remembers the law? And this is literally what they said. Amru, klum adam im Pesach Shabbat im lav. Does anybody know what we do in this situation? It's like the Sanhedrin was, was stuck. So there is one guy, but he's not a local. He's from Babylon, and his name is Hillel. But he studied with the greats, Shmaya and Aftalion. And he knows. So they called him, and they asked him, Do you know? So he said, He said, we bring sacrifices all the time on Shabbat. Right? In the temple, sacrifices were brought on Shabbat. We say it in our prayers on Shabbat. Sacrifices were brought on Shabbat. So why is this any different? A Pesach sacrifice is also a sacrifice. Just like other sacrifices were brought on Shabbat, this one you can also bring on Shabbat. Now, what would you, refu- what would you reply to that if you had to refute it? Good, so... The, the, okay, true. true. That's one argument, but there's another one, which is that the Korbanot of Shabbat were done in the temple. But the Korban Pesach doesn't, wasn't done in the temple. The Korban Pesach was done by every individual family. And they were all doing it simultaneously. You couldn't have a million people in the temple. The Korban Pesach was done all over, in the, around the temple mount. Even today, you have the people, the Temple Institute and other groups that every year on Pesach, they, wanna, they try to smuggle in the sheep, the lamb, to the temple mount, and they try to sacrifice to do a proper Korban Pesach. 
and the authorities don't let them. You know, there's this double standard, right? The Temple Mount is forbidden for anybody but Muslims to pray there. That's not fair. It's supposed to be an international holy site, but Jews are not allowed to do any rituals on the Temple Mount. It's like it's only for Muslims. So there's always Jewish groups trying to go in there and not just pray, but before Pesach, there's always Jews trying to go there and do a Korban Pesach. And you know, they're being restrained by, not only by the police, and the secular authorities, but also by the ultra-Orthodox who don't allow going up on the Temple Mount. Although it doesn't really make sense because the argument is, the ultra-Orthodox argument is, you shouldn't go on the Temple Mount because you might be impure and, or you are impure and you're going on a, a holy spot and that could be punishable by karet. Karet means you know, being spiritually excised from the people. But the counter-argument is, from the people that want to bring the Korban Pesach is... The majority of the Jews have men and it's allowed. True, but even more than that. The Torah says that if you don't bring a Korban Pesach, you're karet. <laughs> so you're karet anyways. Right? So what do you have to lose by going up on the Temple Mount? You're already, by not doing Korban Pesach, you're karet. Right? So it's an interesting argument. No, not really, not for the Korban Pesach. That, again, it wasn't done in the temple. The Korban Pesach was done anywhere on the Temple Mount. Anyway, it's an interesting debate. I've written about it before. Should you go on the Temple Mount or not? But that's a different question. But, uh, you know, there are to this day groups of Jews that try to bring a Korban Pesach on the Temple Mount uh, to fulfill, you know, the mitzvah. Because it is, it is a big mitzvah. So that's what happened with Hillel. Hillel said, listen, we bring sacrifice all the time. Plus... Hillel explained that it says, Ne'emar mo'ado Pesach. Again, that word mo'ado, that Pesach has to be brought in its specific time. Just like it says mo'ado tamid, just like it says with the tamid offering, which was brought on Shabbat, that it had to be brought in its time, even on Shabbat, which means that it's the same mo'ado. And, and the same thing with Brit Milah, that Brit Milah, the Torah says, has to be on the eighth day. That means that even though generally you're not supposed to do any kind of surgical procedure on Shabbat, but if it's a Brit Milah, you're allowed to do it on the eighth day on Shabbat because the Torah says it has to happen on that appointed in its time. So same thing with Korban Pesach. It has to be in its appointed time. So he made it very clear and he even added, Ve'od kal v'chomer. There's another kal v'chomer. It's obviously a fortiori. Umat tamid she'ein anush karet. With the tamid, if you don't bring a tamid, you're not karet. You're not cut off. It's not such a big deal. But Pesach, she'anosh karet, but if you don't bring the Pesach, you're karet. So of course it's going to be dochet Shabbat, because it's much more important than the Tamid. So Hillel gave them a whole bunch of proofs that you have to do it on Shabbat. And so right away, miyad hoshivu barosh, right away they ele- promoted him, uminuhu nasi alem, and they made him the nasi. Ve'ayad doresh kol hayom kulo bilchot Pesach. So that's how Hillel became the president because of this issue of Pesach and Shabbat. Okay, so the point is that Pesach and Shabbat go together. And again, we mentioned Masachet Pesachim. It actually begins by saying, or it begins by going into a long exposition of what does it mean the light of the 14th of Nisan and actually going back to creation and trying to define what Or actually means in the context of creation. So that's actually how Masechet Pesachim, the tractate of Pesach, begins with a discussion of creation, of the light of creation. So all over the place where you look, there's this clear connection between Pesach and Shabbat. Okay, so now what does all of this mean for us? If you look at creation, we know that there are 32 paths of creation. It's, it's Sefer Yetzirah begins this way. It says, Belamed Bet Netivot, with 32 paths God created the whole cosmos. We had a class on that a very long time ago about the 32 paths of wisdom, the 32 paths of creation, which correspond to the 32 times that it says in Genesis that God did something. God is mentioned 32 times. The word Elohim is mentioned 32 times in chapter 1 of Genesis. So there's 32 paths. There are 32 things that God is described as doing. And out of those, 10 of them are utterances that God said, like we saw earlier. But if you look a little closer, in addition to those 10, you'll find, if you actually look at how many distinct actions God makes, even not just necessarily that, but if you look at like the distinct things that God created, and I'll go through them, one way to count them is you'll find 14 things that God created. So in addition to the 10 utterances, 
with some variation, because like, for example, the utterance of a blessing is not necessarily a creation, right? If you look at what God actually created, there's 14 things that he created. And they correspond, once you put them on a list, you make another table, and you look at those 14, and you connect them to the 14 steps of the seder, they actually fit together so beautifully that I don't think you're going to say it's a coincidence, right? They fit the seder of Pesach and the seder of creation, the order of Pesach and the order of creation actually match up perfectly. So let's go through it, and then we'll finish. So... The first step, the first thing in creation we said is Bereshit. Bereshit is the creation of time itself, the beginning of time, right? The whole concept of beginnings, the beginning of time and place, cosmos, time. So that's Bereshit. That's the first thing. And then the next thing that God creates, the next action that's described by God is, the next verse in the Torah is what? It says, Veruach Elohim merachefet al pnei amayim. That God was hovering over the waters. So what does that mean? Why does that... What is that verse? It seems to be a very perplexing verse. The cosmos was chaotic. right? And there was choshech, darkness upon the deep. And the Spirit of God hovers over the waters. What does that even mean? The Arizal's whole philosophy was built on this pasuk. The whole thing that all, the Arizal's Kabbalah is like centered around a few major ideas, but one key idea, which is what? Sure. Which is Shvirat Kelim, right? The shattering of the vessels. This whole idea of God made a perfect cosmos, but it shattered into little sparks. And our job is to rectify, to do tikkun, right? To bring, to rebuild the whole cosmos. That is the essence of the Arizal's whole Kabbalistic system of Shvirat Kelim and tikkun rectifying the broken vessels. And he gets it all. He says it all comes from this second verse. That the, the cosmos was, was chaotic and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Merachefet. The Arizal says Merachefet is Met Rapach. The letters. The letters Merachefet mean Met Rapach. That the Rapach, the 288, the Rapach is 288. That the cosmos shattered into 288 pieces that we need to put back to their place. So he derives it from this exact place, that the cosmos was chaotic, and our job is to bring order to a disordered universe. And it's all a meditation on this one verse, and specifically the word merachefet. So it has huge meaning. It's a key step in creation that we sometimes overlook if we just look at the pshat. But it's deeply symbolic and meaningful in Kabbalistic literature. And more than that, what happened on this, in this moment? Chazal say something really amazing. What does it mean that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters? What did God create at that moment? Do you remember what the Midrash says? Yeah, so listen to what it says in Bereshit Rabbah. Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish Patar, he was, he was able to deduce from this verse the four exiles of the Jewish people. So the first one is, The fact that the universe was chaotic, what does that mean? Zegalut Bavel. That is the first, that corresponds to the first exile, the Babylonian exile. And he brings a proof from Jeremiah. When Jeremiah is describing Babylon, he's saying it's Tohu. So Reish Lakish says, when the Torah says, Zaita Tohu, that's clearly a hint to Babylon. All right, it's Xera Shaba, it's the same term as being used, these unique words, Tohu. Vebohu, what is Bohu? Bohu is the next exile, which is Madai and Paras the Persian one, and he brings a proof from Esther, because in Esther it says, Vayavhilu le'aviyat haman. Yavhilu le'aviyat haman. That's an uh, allusion to vohu, tohu vavohu. And then choshech, darkness is, zegalut yavan, the Greek exile, the Greek persecution. Sheikh shichai neem shel Israel. And then al pnei tehom, the deeps, the depths, the abyss, zegalut mamlechet arasha'a. This is the Edomite exile that we're still in. The, the long Roman exile, that's why it's a tehom. It's like a bottomless pit because it's been going on for centuries and centuries and two millennia. It's the longest persecution. It's the longest exile. And then finally, how does that verse end? Veruach Elohim merachefet al pnei amayim. Who is that? Ze rucho shel melech ha-mashiach. That's what it says. So it's like God brought us through all these exiles and ultimately it will all end with Mashiach. 
And how do you know that Ruach Elohim refers to Mashiach? Because Isaiah says, Ruach Hashem, that the Spirit of God will be upon Mashiach. That's not so specific. I know some Christians will say, oh, you see. No, lots of people have the Spirit of God in the Torah. It says Yosef had the Spirit of God. Yoshua had the Spirit of God. Shimshon had the Spirit of God. So that term of, being, of having the Holy Spirit is not unique to any one Jew that lived 2,000 years ago. It's anybody could have. Any Jew can have the Holy Spirit. Any human could potentially have. We spoke about Metatron, Chanoch. So anybody could have the Spirit of God upon him. So anyway, that's how we know. Uh, Reish Lakish says, Ruach Elohim Merachefet Al Pnei Amayim is the Spirit of Mashiach that God created already. Because we know the rule is that God creates the cure before the disease. So even before he already decreed that there would be exiles and persecution and suffering and October 7 and all of that, even before that, God already made the cure before the disease. He already put the solution before the, the problem. So that was day two. So there's that creation. The, then, sorry, not day two. The second thing that God created. Then the third thing was the creation of light. The fourth thing was separating the waters. And then on that as well, when he separated the waters, we said earlier that God also created Gehenom. And that's why it wasn't a good day. And the Midrash says, Lama ein k'tiv b'sheni kitov? Why does the second day not say it was good? Lefisha bo nivra Gehenom. Because that's the day that God created Gehenom. And it brings a verse to prove it, a verse from Isaiah, which compares Gehenom, which is also called Tophet, to the second day of creation. But in the interest of time, we'll skip it for now. But he brings a very clear derivation from Isaiah, how we know that Gehenom was created on the second day. And then the sixth thing, the sixth action was gathering the lower waters. The seventh was making the dry land appear. And then the eighth was the vegetation. The ninth was the stars. The tenth was the fish and birds. The eleventh was taninim agdolim, va'ivra Elohim et taninim agdolim. That's a distinct step. Then the land animals, then humans, and then Shabbat. So you have 14 steps in the order of creation, and you have 14 steps in the Pesach Seder. Now look at how beautifully they correspond with each other. Again, you can put these two columns together and look at them. The first thing in creation was the creation of time, Bereshit. The first thing in the Pesach Seder is Kadesh. We are sanctifying time. We make a Kiddush. We're saying now is a special time, right? We're saying a blessing on this particular Moed, on this particular Zman. That's the, that's the blessing that we say, right? In the Kadesh that God is sanctifying. We are sanctifying these holy occasions. So we're sanctifying time. The first thing in the order of creation was the creation of time. The first step in the Seder is the sanctification of this time. The second thing in the order of creation was God hovering over the waters. What's the next thing we do? The second thing we do in the Seder? Uchatz, washing your hands. Waters, hovering over the waters, you're hovering over the waters. But you're not saying a bracha, right? You don't say a bracha the first time you wash. Then the third thing is, uh, in creation was God said, let there be light. And the third thing in the seder is karpas, which we still have to come back to. So be patient for a little longer. <laughs> What's the connection between light and karpas? And then yachatz is the next step in the seder, which is splitting the matzah. And what was the next step in the order of creation? Separating, splitting the waters. Right, splitting here, splitting here. The same, the same thing. Then you have Magid. Magid is when you say the whole Haggadah. A Magid also refers to an angel. There's a type of angel called a Magid. Right? An angel that speaks to you, that brings you divine information. So this corresponds to the next thing, which is the creation of the heavens and, of, and hell, and the creation of all the angels and all the, the heavenly species who are able to communicate like us who God gave the ability to speak. Right? Only humans and angels have that ability. So that Yosef corresponds Karo. to Magid. Exactly. Yosef Karo had the Magid, Magid Meisharim, right? that he spoke with too. Then the next step was God gathering the lower waters. The next step in the Seder, Rochza, washing again. So corresponding to the waters. Then the next step in creation was the dry land appears. What's the next step in the Seder? Hamotzi lechem min haaretz bringing the stuff from the lab, bringing food 
from the land, bread of the land. The next step in creation was God made the vegetation, the herbs. What's the next step in the seder? Maror, eating the herbs. You see how they're perfectly paralleling each other? Then you have korech, which corresponds to the stars. God made the luminaries. What's the connection? Again, same. The korech is symbolic of the korban Pesach. You look at what Chazal say. Why do we bring the korban Pesach? Because the Egyptians worshipped the ram. They had a ram-headed god at that time. The astrological sign of Nisan is Aries, is a sheep, is a ram. And the Egyptians had their ram-headed god. They had Osiris, who was depicted with a ram horn. Chnum, which was their ram-headed god. So it was an attack on their gods. It's like we were slaughtering their false deities. So that corresponds to the stars, like we said, that they worshipped these stars with their animal symbolism. And then you have the Shulchan Orech, you're eating. And that corresponds to the next utterance, which is making fish and birds. And there used to be actually a requirement. If you look at the Geonim, Rav, Rav Shri Ragon says you should eat fish at the Pesach Seder. That corresponds to actually the Seudat Leviathan that we talked about last time. So you eat fish, you eat eggs, the birds, the fish, that corresponds to the utterance of the birds and fish. Then you have Tzafun. Tzafun means eating the hidden matzah, right? the one that you put away. That corresponds to Ivraita the Tanini Magdolim. Remember what we said about the Tanini Magdolim? That there was two of them, the two serpents. God sl- slayed one and hid the other one until the end of days. Castrated and hid the other one. That's the Tzafun, right? It's a symbol of the end of days, the final feast of the Leviathan that we're going to have at the end of days. Then Barech is you say Birkat Amazon over the land. And this is the creation of the, the land animals that we ate meat on the Chag, and now we're satiated, and we say Birkat HaMazon because we're full, because we had the proper meal with the meat. And then finally, Halel, which corresponds to the creation of humans, for a very obvious reason, because we humans are the only ones that can do Halel, that can praise God. We were created to praise God, to find Hashem, to find our Maker, and to connect with our Maker, to fulfill our purpose, to connect with Hashem, that's Halel. And the last thing is Nirza. Nirza is when we make a wish for the next year to have Shabbat in Jerusalem, which will be the ultimate Shabbat, the a thousand year period of Shabbat, the Yom Shekulo Shabbat, and that corresponds to the creation of, of Shabbat, of the final, the end of days, or the final millennium of Shabbat, so to the creation of Shabbat. Okay, it makes sense? I know that was really fast. You have five more minutes to do the last thing on Karpas and, and Maro. Okay, I'll skip Maro and I'll just do Karpas because we don't have time for both. So I'm going to jump ahead. We'll just do karpas. See, Maro, we can't get to it. It has to stay mysterious. What does karpas actually mean? Karpas is a vegetable. It literally means in Greek, karpas means vegetable. Okay, the Greek word karpas means vegetable. Despite the fact that it's a Greek word, karpas, it's also a Hebrew word. And it appears just one place in the whole Tanakh. And we just read it. You said it. Exactly. In the Megillah, we just read Megillah Tester. When it describes the banquet of Achashverosh, what does it say? Chur karpas utchelet achuz bechavlevutz. Right? It's describing the decor, the upholstery. What do you call it? The, the curtains and all the, uh, the linens that they hung up at the party. And it says... White and cotton and blue wool and fine linen. So karpas is translated as some kind of very fine cotton, some kind of very expensive, rich material. That's karpas. And what is this supposed to represent? What is the symbolism of taking a vegetable karpas? So our sages used, wanted to connect something between this vegetable karpas they see in Megillat Esther, we know that karpas is a very expensive, fine linen thing. And karpas in Greek, in the vernacular language 2,000 years ago, means a vegetable. So our sages said, okay, we'll eat a vegetable. But what is that supposed to represent? What is this fine linen? What is this really expensive fabric? And then we're supposed to take it and dip it in some salt water or some red wine vinegar. What is the symbolism of that? So something very little known is actually this is supposed to represent the sale of Yosef. Because remember, how did we even get to Egypt? 
we're all saying how we got out of Egypt and we're all commemorating how we came out of Egypt. Fine. But how did we get to Egypt? <laughs> that was the sale of Yosef because the brothers apparently sold Yosef to Egypt, although they actually didn't. It's important to remember this. A lot of people make this mistake. They think that the brothers sold Yosef to Egypt. The brothers did not sell Yosef. It does not say in the Torah that they sold Yosef. It says in the Torah, V'yavru anashim midyanim. The brothers just threw him in the pit. And then they were deliberating what to do with him. And they didn't know. And Yehuda said, well, maybe we'll sell him. But while they were deliberating, and he was in the pit, it says, V'yavru anashim midyanim. Midianites came. Socharim, Midianite merchants. Yosef. They took him out, min habor, out of the, the pit. Yosef le Ishmaelim. The Midianites discovered this guy by himself, you know, naked and weak, 17-year-old guy. And they enslaved him and sold him to the Ishmaelites. The brothers were not even there. The brothers were just deliberating what to do with him. And then the Midianites took him, enslaved him, sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And then, and then Reuben came back to the pit to save him. And he wasn't there. And he tore his clothes. Oh my gosh, we lost our little bro. And he came back to his brothers. The kid's gone. That means they didn't know what happened to him. The brothers had no clue what happened to him. They did not sell him. That is a, one of the classic misconceptions. The brothers did not sell Yosef. They had no idea what happened to him. That's why when they came to Egypt all those years later, they had no clue it was him. If they had sold him to Egypt, they'd know he was there. And if they repented, as we know they did, they would have gone down to Egypt to look for him, obviously. They never did because they had no clue where he was. He just disappeared. So it's important to remember that. The brothers didn't sell Yosef. And it's important to tell that to your kids. Because if you're a parent and you're trying to explain the Torah to your children, how do you explain such bizarre that brothers could sell each other? You know, we're always teaching our children to be united and to take care of each other and to always be together and to never abandon each other. This is not a story where brothers sold their brother, God forbid. It's a story where brothers were temporarily mad at their brother and abandoned him. And in that small temporary lapse in judgment, they lost him. And then they tore their clothes because they were so ashamed of what they did. That's the story there. So you're supposed to use that to teach your kids, never abandon each other, even for one second, no matter how angry you might be or whatever. You, know, there's, you always have to be together 100% of the time. We, they then took his very expensive tunic, that special fine linen, whatever it was, the karpas, and they dipped it in blood, and then they pretended like he died. So the whole idea of dipping the karpas in red wine vinegar, which is like blood, or in salt water, which is like tears, is to represent the sale of, or the loss of Yosef. Not quite a sale. The brothers didn't sell him. The Midianites sold him. But it's to represent the loss of Yosef, which is how we actually ended up in Egypt. So that's what the karpas is really all about. Now, what does that have to do, and we'll, we'll finish with this, what does that have to do with the third Thing in the order of creation that we said, which is Vayehi O, let there be light. What is the connection between, we're saying each of the 14 steps of creation and the 14 steps of the Seder have to parallel each other. So what's the connection between Karpas and Yehi O and Vayehi O? So this is an amazing Midrash. Another Midrash, Bereshit Rabbah. What does it say? And we'll, we'll end with this. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman Patach. He says like this. Jeremiah says, quotes, God, that God knows all of our thoughts. God knows all of our things, everything that we, our plans. And of course, God has his own plans and they're different from our plans. So the Midrash says like this, Bereshit Rabbah, what happened at the sale of Yosef? Shvatim ayu asukin b'mechirato shel Yosef. So the tribes were busy thinking about at that event when the tribes were busy with dealing with the sale of Yosef. Not, not that they sold him, meaning what to do with, let's see what it says later. So the tribes were busy dealing with the fact that Yosef had been sold, that Yosef is gone. And then what? And Yosef was busy fasting and repenting and praying and 
Reuven haya asuk besako betanito. And Reuven was repenting and crying and, you know, in his sack and uh, ashes and whatever because of what happened. Ve Yaakov haya asuk besako betanito. And Yaakov was mourning in sackcloth and ashes. Ve Yehuda haya asuk with... Yehuda was busy with likach lo isha. Because we know that right away, right after the sale of Yosef, it says Yehuda went and tried to get his mind off things and separated from the family and went to get married. And what was God doing? Everybody was busy with their things. Mm-hmm. And God at that time was making the light of Mashiach. So again, just as we said earlier, before the disease, God already brought the cure. Right? Before the first exile, before they went into Egypt, God already brought the last Redeemer. That's how everything was spun. So, and it actually says here, right? so, And the Midianites sold him to Egypt. Right? What happened at that moment? That they, while they were selling him to Egypt, which led to the Jews coming into the first persecution, the Egyptian exile, God already brought about the Goel Acharon, the final Redeemer. So that's how the light of the first, the light of creation corresponds to the Karpas of Yosef. And really now we have a whole bigger question here. Because first of all, we have a dilemma. The first dilemma is, wait a second. We said, Ruach Elohim Merachefet Al Pnei means God already had the soul of Mashiach then, in creation, on the very first day. So how can the Midrash now come and tell me, same Midrash, Midrash Rabbah, how can the same Midrash now come and tell me that no, Orosh Al Mashiach was made when Yosef was being sold to Egypt? That seems to contradict, no? What's that? It's B. It's B? A. A. Yeah. Okay, so you can say one was the soul of Mashiach, okay, and this is the light of Mashiach, maybe not the same. Is there a difference? Not clear, right? Maybe it means that the soul was made there, but the light means it started to be revealed in the world, the messianic process. You can also look at it a different way. You can say the first one was referring to Mashiach ben David. This is talking about Yosef, the sale of Yosef. This is talking about Mashiach ben Yosef. And that's our segue to talk about Mashiach ben Yosef next time. Because I think the idea of Mashiach ben Yosef is something that's very deeply misunderstood. It's something that pretty much nobody talks about. You hear about it here and there very casually. People kind of bring it up superficially, but nobody ever really talks about this idea. Who said that there's two Mashiachs? Where did this whole idea come from? Who said that there's a Mashiach ben Yosef and a Mashiach ben David? Where does it come from? What does it actually mean? What is the point of Mashiach ben Yosef? It's something very confusing and something that you hear almost nothing about. So that's really the segue. I wanted to do a series about Mashiach ben Yosef. As a final to conclude the kind of like discussion of all the things about the end of days to talk about Mashiach ben Yosef. So we'll do, God willing, we'll do that next time. We'll start a series on Mashiach ben Yosef. Uh, but we'll end with that for now. So I wish you all a, a happy kosher Pesach. Chag Sameach. If I don't see you.